I put up the screens on the floor. They take the screens and then two slides later the hiding answer in red. Don't go to the answer before they finish the quiz. And it's this one right here at the top. Great. You can't read up. Yeah, no, I, I have it. It's the one you just put. So actually, here, I'll give you your drive back. Um, Thank you, sir. Where are you going tonight? Back to, back I have to visited here in Snow. I'm going up to Vancouver tonight. Yeah. Just came back from uh, chatting with Jim Simons in New York, <laughs> which uh, after 10 minutes I had to. Uh, leave because he started smoking and there was just this cloud of smoke coming into my face. Every time he sees me, he says, I'm sorry. That I <laughs> is, is he reasonably alert these days? Um, you know, he was there for my talk and I chatted with him, but then he missed most of the other meeting uh, and he, he got quite tired and so on. So, you're, you're but he's, he's eating. No, I have to get get in a plane. Yeah, sorry. Okay, let's get started here. So, um, last lecture on learning and memory for me. Before we move on to sort of the last component of the course, which is going to be a bit on emotion, autism, and um, other diseases of the brain and the mind to finish the course on. So uh, remember uh, from the last lecture I gave and also from Henry Lester's lecture, you know that memory consists of multiple stages, both psychologically and neurobiologically. Um, so there are uh, events at the molecular level that uh, require calcium influx through NMDA receptors and phosphorylation of various proteins that can happen fairly quickly. And then there are events that require gene expression um, through Krebs binding proteins and other mechanisms that can result in ultrastructural changes. So there are multiple stages in time. And remember that psychologically there were multiple stages, short-term memory, long-term memory, iconic memory. Um, and as well, there are multiple types of memory. And um, so far, we only looked at declarative memory. So today we'll look at a a uh, couple of the different types of non-declarative memory, of which you'll remember there are several. So remember this picture here, just to, re uh, just to re remind you and see if people have any questions. Um, that was sort of the broadest scheme for getting a memory in, encoding, and then there was a set of long drawn out processes that could go on for years that consolidated the memory. And then there were two types of retrieval, one of which is shown here, the two types of retrieval being recall and recognition. Um, and one thing that's, that I mentioned uh, but didn't go much into that's quite important these days is this reconsolidation. So remember that when you remember a memory, it becomes a stimulus, again, in its own right, and you can re-encode and reconsolidate that memory. And so every time you remember something, it becomes plastic and flexible to some extent, and it's reconsolidated. So if you keep remembering something and talking about it, you can change the memory over time. You can have false memories over time. And this is one mechanism that people have looked at a lot for um, traumatic memories, and phobias, post-traumatic stress disorder, and so forth, that one mechanism for trying to help people with those kinds of traumatic memories is to have them recall the memory such that it becomes sort of plastic again and can be reconsolidated with a different uh, memory trace. So you have them reconsolidate, you have them recall very traumatic memories, and while they're doing that, you can give them drugs or you can do behavioral interventions such that the new consolidation that is laid down can overwrite the previous one and can to some extent uh, cure their traumatic memory. So that's one clinically relevant mechanism. So again, to get a memory, uh, plastic and have a change, you need to retrieve it, and then you, this reconsolidation mechanism uh, can make it uh, to some extent uh, flexible. This scheme we had, remember, short term memory, which depends uh, mostly on regions in the frontal lobe. There are neurons there that uh, are highly correlated with holding something in working memory in humans and in monkeys. Limited capacity, about seven items, decays quickly after about a minute or less. And if you keep stuff in here, you keep rehearsing it, there is a 
bottleneck for transferring information from stuff you're currently thinking about, working memory, into long-term memory, which is what you want to do when you memorize material for a course. You can't keep it all in, in your head all the time. You have to offload it and uh, stabilize it in long-term memory. If you're successful at doing that, so there's a, it takes a while, so doing this requires the hippocampus, um, and it's, not, it's effortful, and it's subject to interference, it takes time, etc. But when you do it, in principle, long-term memory has no known upper bound in humans, um, and, also it, and also no bound in terms of time. So you can remember things, an arbitrary number of things for an arbitrary amount of time in principle. And some people are very good at this, so some people seem to be able to remember every day of their lives, uh, and it's a big puzzle why not everybody is like that. It'd make it much easier for this course if you just remembered everything, right? Um, there are also some people, just to mention it quickly, um, that either because they're born that way or because of a lot of practice, probably both, uh, that typically are sort of performance artists in Vegas or something, that seem to be able to merge um, working memory and long-term memory, and they've done brain imaging studies on these people, so they effectively are able to use their long-term memory as though it were working memory. And of course, if you do that, you have an unlimited storage capacity, and you can just read, you know, 100 digits of pi or something, and it's in there. Uh, so there are people that can do that, and they seem to be able to not have the same bottleneck for transferring between these two types that... Uh, you and I have. So there's all kinds of unusual uh, features, but this is how, how it normally works, uh, but there are uh, exceptional memory cases that uh, still need to be explained. This is what we had last time, so remember that there was a graded retrograde amnesia, a complete anterograde amnesia if you have damage to the hippocampus like this patient HM had. Um, one thing that's important to point out is that uh, episodic memory, so memorying a, remembering a particular autobiographical episode, like exactly what you had for breakfast this morning, uh, where and with whom you went out to dinner last night, so the, your ability to consciously re-experience something in space and time uh, and as happening to you, that depends on the hippocampus, uh, but over time seems to be converted to another form of declarative memory called semantic memory, which is just memory for facts. So most of your memory eventually gets converted into facts. So, you know, I could ask you what's, what's, the, what's the capital of France, you would say Paris, uh, and that would just be semantic memory. But if I asked you, well, where did you learn that? What specific episode? Or, you know, who's the president of, of the US? Or even uh, material for this course. After a while, you would know it as facts, <clears throat> even though initially it was encoded as an episodic memory. But, so these traces seem to be recoded as semantic memory over, type, over time. Let me just put um, various types of declarative memory that people have studied up here. So semantic memory depends on neocortex, especially in the temporal lobe, and there are neurodegenerative diseases, for instance, that affect temporal cortex, which uh, will, will result in semantic dementia and a loss of semantic memory. But this is memory for facts. Episodic memory is memory for specific autobiographical episodes, and that depends on the hippocampus as well as other regions. Your autobiographical memory is a mix, so a lot of it is episodic, but some of it, like just remember knowing your name or knowing your, when you're born, that's semantic, so it's a mix. And then people have studied a lot so-called flashbulb memories, um, which are events in your own life that are, uh, that are episodic and remembered particularly well. Uh, with particular vividness, which are basically all, all um, emotional events in your lives. Let me just put that up here. So they've studied this. More recent um, studies have looked at 9-11, you know, any sort of public, um, highly emotional event. And uh, psychologists have then been fond of doing studies on that whenever something like that happens, uh, or, or the latest uh, incidents in, in Paris. Uh, I'm sure there's psychologists now studying how that's encoded in people's memories. And what you find when you ask people is that they're typically able to um, recollect a lot of autobiographical detail, much more so than, you know, if you ask them for non-emotional uh, events. And so they've studied this both for real life events and also in the lab. And the basic idea is that emotion serves as a sort of, uh, like a spotlight, as a sort of filter, 
on your encoding and, in particular, consolidation of declarative memory. So if you look, it's a little hard to see here, if you look at some picture that's emotional or arousing in the middle here, because I guess there's a surgery going on, what you will remember is the deep, if I asked you afterwards for your uh, visual memory for this picture, you would remember a lot about the emotional stuff having to do with the surgery in the middle, and probably less about people in the background, etc. Uh, people have studied this a lot in terms of eyewitness testimony at crime scenes. They'll remember details about the blood or the knife, but they won't remember who the bystanders were um, and things like that. And the same thing happens in time. If you have, for instance, a stream of words in an experiment, one of which is more emotional than the others, you will remember this word, but your memory for words in the vicinity of that is actually decreased. So it's like, sort of like a center surround mechanism, actually in both space and time that serves to sharpen your memory for that material that's the most salient, in this case, most um, emotional. And as I said, this people have studied this in quite some detail. This is how traumatic memories also arise. Uh, and it mostly operates uh, in, in, re in real life at the level of consolidation. So you can give, if people experience a very traumatic uh, event, or if rats, if you have rats in a very traumatic event, you can, after the event, you can give them, for instance, protein synthesis inhibitors or drugs that would interfere with memory consolidation, and they would not um, uh, lay down an emotional memory for that uh, event. Okay, so just uh, to summarize, so we talked about declarative memory last time, just to make the point that it's extremely complicated and it has lots of different ways in which it is modulated. So this was one example, it can be sharpened, uh, by emotional arousal, which is one mechanism that people have looked, looked at a lot. We're going to move over now to considering some aspects of non-declarative memory. Remember, this is a heterogeneous category, unlike declarative memory. So for declarative memory, you can say it's memory for facts and events, it's relational memory, it's spatial memory, it depends critically on the hippocampus at encoding and consolidation. So we know a lot in a sort of fairly homogeneous system Non-declarative memory is a whole bunch of stuff that depends on a whole bunch of different brain systems. Before we do that, we're going to have a short quiz that Henry just gave me. And so, if you can get a pen and a piece of paper. All right, so we had um, types of memory. Now we're going to go on to talking about some types of non-declarative memory. So. There are two broad types, which are associative and non-associative. And here's the definition of these. So non-associative learning, you've uh, probably heard about both of these before, is learning with respect to a single stimulus. So you're not associating two stimuli. It's just one stimulus that's happening. But of course, you have plasticity. And so learning in a very simple sense there. Does anybody want to know what kind of um, phenomena you have that would count as learning in this very simple sense for just repetitions of a single Stimulus? Any guess? Well, either increments or decrements in response, so some change. And decrements are habituation, and increments would be sensitization. So those two, those have been studied a lot. Associative learning is learning about relationships between, stimu between two stimuli, that's Pavlovian conditioning, we'll take a look at that in a minute, or between a um, behavior and an outcome, or a stimulus and an outcome, which is instrumental learning. So those are the two big kinds, uh, which just lists them here. So this just says what I said. Your book goes through um, non-associative learning in the sea slug, where Eric Kandel, who's one of the co-authors of your book, uh, and his colleagues did a lot of work and won the Nobel Prize for uh, a lot of the work that they did. You can find these animals here if you go out to the tide pools in the ocean. So they're just little mollusks. They'll put out jets of ink. Um, and I guess you could, well, you probably can't do this. I think you have to take them apart a little bit to actually touch them. Well, you can probably touch them and you could see what happens. But you could do the same thing to a slug or a snail. Um, maybe you've done this when you were a little kid. If you touch part of the animal, um, it will withdraw parts of its body. If you do that again, it'll withdraw and it'll take even longer to come out. If you then wait a long time, uh, you can start over again. So there are changes over time in the efficacy with which a sensory stimulus causes a motor response. And this has been 
worked out in some detail. Here's the little circuitry. And in particular, if you record from the sensory neuron, from the motor neuron, and uh, look at what might happen in between those two, uh, where you find the change is in the synaptic efficacy of the sensory motor onto the motor neuron. So the sensory neuron responds the same all the time. That's what's shown in this trace. But over time, if you keep touching the siphon on this aplesia, it will become habituated because there is less transmitter release. So you can ask very mechanistic questions about exactly where, at which synapse, these plastic changes that uh, define the change between stimulus and response actually occur in these simple nervous systems. Um, so your book goes over that in detail, and it has, of course, been mapped out. And one nice feature of this is that it also um, has this whole the, uh, molecular machinery here. This is for sensitization and aplesia. Um, has been worked out in a, in a great detail and uh, distinguishes the molecular mechanism for short-term memory, which depends on just phosphorylation of um, receptors and ion channels, like the serotonin receptor here. So that's not that permanent, but it can take place quite quickly. And long-term changes, which depend on changes in gene expression. So cyclic AMP has to bind to the cyclic AMP response element binding protein and bind to DNA. There's differential gene transcription. New protein, synth protein synthesis is required for this. And new proteins can be made. New receptors can be inserted. There can be ultrastructural changes and so on. And you can manipulate these as you would expect. So in general, if you block short-term memory, you also block the induction of long-term memory. But you can have short-term memory going on, but if you have, for instance, a protein synthesis inhibitor, you will block the induction of long-term memory. And there are many different versions of this that uh, initially um, behavioral psychologists have studied, and now we know a lot about uh, the neural underpinnings of many of these. So there are associations between stimuli, responses, and outcomes, which is what these letters stand for. In terms of just basic things to know, uh, these here, so an unconditioned stimulus is a stimulus, the response to which you don't need to learn. So it's innate. And so if you, you know, uh, see something dangerous, if you see a snake or uh, uh, something like that, or if you get electric shock, you don't need to learn to uh, fear that, you would uh, respond to that in an unconditioned way. So you have unconditioned responses to unconditioned stimuli, for which learning is not essential. Uh, and then conditioned stimuli are the opposite. For those, you have to learn the conditioned response. And so in typical, um, for instance, Pavlovian conditioning setups, you pair uh, stimuli with unconditioned, conditioned stimuli with unconditioned stimuli, and you can learn about the value, good or bad, of a conditioned stimulus. I'll show you an example in a minute. In a minute. Well, here's the first one. Um, uh, Ivan Pavlov, who won the Nobel Prize in 1904 uh, for his work on what's now known as Pavlovian uh, conditioning in, order, in, in honor of him. This is a form, in his experiment, it was a form of appetitive conditioning, but you could also do this for aversive stimuli. So in his case, he measured a response in the dog, which was this, the um, secretion of saliva and gastric juice, uh, in response to food. So that happens normally without any learning. So if you give the dog food, it will salivate and there will be gastric secretions in the stomach as an unconditioned response. So the food is an unconditioned stimulus. But in addition, you have a bell or some other uh, stimulus that you pair with the presentation of food. As all pet owners know, your pet will very quickly learn that this stimulus, the sound of the can being opened, or the, what, any kind of stimulus that is regularly paired with the presentation of food, is predictive of the food. And you will get salivation and gastric juice secretion to the tone after learning. So initially, the tone does nothing. It's meaningless. But it acquires meaning through its regular um, relationship with the presentation of the food, and that's what he measured here. So here's how that would go. These are slides from my colleague John O'Doherty over in the social sciences who does a lot of this work, or more complicated versions of this, in humans with fMRI. So, but this is the basic idea. You have an unconditioned response to an unconditioned stimulus, and if you regularly pair a number of times a conditioned stimulus with this, what will happen is that you get a conditioned response 
that anticipates uh, the food. So in a sense, you can think of the, the conditioned response in this simple example as uh, being like the unconditioned response only moved forward in time. In fact, it's typically more complicated than that, and conditioned responses do not need to mimic unconditioned responses. Uh, it's typically more complicated. But at any rate, they're predictive responses to a stimulus that predicts a later unconditioned stimulus. Any questions about this? It's clear to people, the basic setup. Um, there are various versions of this that you don't need to know, so we'll skip that one. One structure that's been studied in great detail for Pavlovian conditioning, uh, mostly for aversive Pavlovian conditioning, so-called Pavlovian fear conditioning. So it's the same thing as what I showed you, except that instead of food, you have electric shock or some bad unconditioned stimulus, but otherwise it's the same setup, is the amygdala. And the amygdala in the human brain is shown here. This is a post-mortem human brain. So it's like the brains that you had in your first discussion section that's been sectioned and stained for myelin. So myelin is black, and you see the thalamus here. Uh, here is part of the ventricle. And down here, where my cursor is circling right now, is the medial temporal lobe, and this structure here is the amygdala. It sits just in front of the hippocampus. So it's a collection of nuclei. Here's how it looks in the structural MRI scan. That's involved in a lot of, a lot of different things, but in particular, a lot of different learning mechanisms and it interacts with many other brain structures to implement those. So for instance, remember I talked briefly just a few minutes ago, uh, ago about highly emotional events like the explosion of the space shuttle or 9-11, etc., that you remember extremely well, these so-called flashbulb memories. The amygdala seems to be responsible for that. So it modulates how the hippocampus functions. It has projections to the hippocampus so that when there is some strongly emotional event, hippocampal-dependent declarative memory is sort of boosted up and you consolidate that stimulus with more detail. It's also in, interact with the prefrontal cortex and the basal ganglia in various forms of uh, instrumental learning. And within the amygdala, it's involved in Pavlovian fear conditioning, and that's been worked out by uh, quite a few people, in particular Joe Ledoux um, and others, and this is how it would work. So again, you have a conditioned stimulus, like a tone, and instead of getting food, as in Pavlov's case, uh, people typically, because it's more efficacious, use uh, an, an, an aversive unconditioned stimulus, so electric shock. So the rat will uh, avoid and startle and have lots of you know, stress responses to just the shock. If you pair the shock with the tone a bunch of times and then only present the tone, the rat will behave as though it is afraid of the tone. So it will freeze, its blood pressure will go up, etc., because it's expecting to get the shock. But so that's the, that's the acid test of a Pavlovian fear conditioning paradigm. You give the shock and the tone, and the rat you know, freezes and is unhappy. You give the shock and the tone, and the rat does it again. You do that a bunch of times, and then you only give the tone, and the rat will freeze and show fear responses, whereas prior to this learning, the tone did nothing. That difference is the difference in learning. That's Pavlovian fear conditioning. The difference in response that you see to a conditioned stimulus before versus after conditioning. The magnitude of that is the magnitude of your learning. And how does that work? Well, you have to get the tone, so sensory information from the tone through auditory thalamus, auditory cortex. That has to get in to the amygdala. And information from the shock has to get in through the somatosensory system. So you remember these two from lectures you had in the past. And then these have to converge on neurons that can form associations between the two. And what kind, you might wonder what kind of molecular mechanism uh, could implement this sort of convergence. Well, it's exactly like what you heard about before. It's NMDA receptor dependent long term potentiation in these neurons here, in the lateral amygdala, such that when they get coincident inputs about the tone from auditory channels and about the shock from somatosensory channels, they encode that coincidence, and subsequently, either one of those alone, if you just get the tone coming in, is now sufficient to uh, reactivate this uh, memory trace. And then the amygdala projects out to a whole bunch of other places that can affect the behavior, like freezing blood pressure changes and so on. So that's the basic circuitry for Pavlovian fear conditioning. Um, you can do, uh, as in the case of declarative memory, you can... Uh, add on to this various embellishment and uh, ways of modulating this simple circuit so that it can interact 
with other forms of memory. So for instance, if you now put the rat into a particular location in, in, its, in its cage, and you only do this, you only give it a shock when it's in that location, well, that's a form that requires a form of spatial relational memory, which you remember depends on the hippocampus. So you can have contextual fear conditioning that the rat becomes afraid of being in a particular place because it always got shocked in that place. That depends on the amygdala, like Pavlovian fear conditioning, but also on the hippocampus because it, it uh, requires this re uh, relational spatial component. So contextual fear conditioning, if it, re if it requires linking a place to an unconditioned stimulus requires both the amygdala and the hippocampus. Okay, um, so these are just some facts to know. So Pavlovian fear conditioning in humans and in other animals is dissociable from declarative memory. The amygdala basically is, is essential for fear conditioning, the hippocampus for uh, declarative. And there's, uh, people have done, done these studies Here's one done by my former colleague, Antoine Bashara, who's, when he was at the University of Iowa, uh, now at USC, in a human patient. So here's the experiment. You do a, a Pavlovian fear conditioning uh, uh, paradigm, and you measure two types of dependent measures in, this, in, in people. One is just, this, that, like, just like what you would measure in the rat. This is a measure of the emotional response to the conditioned stimulus skin conductance response. That's over, shown over on the left. And the other one is a measure of declarative recall. That's, that is, you ask the person which uh, conditioned stimulus was, was matched with the aversive stimulus. And when you do that, you find in controls that there is learning both about uh, Pavlovian fear conditioning, so these bars over here are higher, and, and in terms of declarative memory for which stimuli were, were paired. You can dissociate these. You can have a patient who has lesions of the amygdala, that's shown in this panel here. This patient has intact declarative memory for which conditioned stimuli were paired with shock, or in this case it was an aversive tone, loud noise, but fails to have Pavlovian fear conditioning. So this shows you that the amygdala is necessary for Pavlovian fear conditioning, but not for declarative memory. Conversely, you can have another patient who has damage to the hippocampus in the bottom, bottom panel, and he has intact Pavlovian fear conditioning, but can't remember, can't tell you anything about the stimuli. So experiments like this, which, so this would be considered a, a double dissociation with respect to the amygdala and the hippocampus, show you what that previous slide just summarized. The amygdala is necessary for Pavlovian fear conditioning, the hippocampus for declarative memory. Let me show you an actual experiment for how this looks. So this person here was a um, postdoc, former postdoc in Elizabeth Phelps' lab at NYU is um, what, undergoing a fear conditioning uh, experiment. So he has an electric shock bracelet on here, and he's going to get shocked every once in a while, and he's watching conditioned stimuli, squares of different colors. So he saw he's been watching a yellow square, nothing happened, so he's not getting conditioned to that yellow square. And they're measuring his skin conductance response and, and other responses. And now he sees a blue square. And as you will see at the offset of this blue square, he gets an unconditioned stimulus, which was the shock. And so this goes on for quite a while. And so every time he sees the yellow square, nothing happens. When he sees the blue square, he gets zapped. And so he becomes Pavlovian conditioned. He becomes fear conditioned to associating the blue square with the shock. And so then you can measure that after he's gone through this a whole bunch of times. Every time the blue square was on, he got zapped, but not with the yellow square. You then, unbeknownst to him, have disconnected the shock thing. So he's not going to get shocked at all. And you only show the conditioned stimuli and measure his response to those. So in the case of the yellow square, you know, there's nothing that's happening. And so you, you will not measure any skin conductance response when he sees that. Um, but for the blue square, his brain predicts that he would get the shock, and so he will have, uh, uh, will have a skin conductance response to the blue square because it was always paired with the shock in the past. And you can kind of, I mean, you can't see unless I showed you a trace of the skin conductance response, but you can tell something about his emotional state just from watching his face, I guess. So he's, you know, been, uh, he was expecting a, sh a shock. If you measure this, in his case, so we would have electrodes on the palms of his hands that measure skin conductance response as a measure of um, sympathetic emotional arousal. 
you find that the blue square, this is the conditioned stimulus that was paired with the shock, the CS plus, elicits a much larger skin conductance response when just shown by itself after training without the shock, then does the yellow square, the CS minus, which is a conditioned stimulus that was not paired with the shock. So that difference shows you that condition, standard Pavlovian fear conditioning happened. Now what's interesting is I could take any of you, having just watched this video, and put skin conductance electrodes on you and show you those same stimuli, the, the blue square, the yellow square, and I would find that you would show the same thing, that you would also show a larger skin conductance response now to the blue square than to the yellow square, even though you yourself never got any electric shock, you just observed another person getting electric shock. So this is called observational learning, and uh, most of what you learn about the world uh, depends on that. So it's not actual experience, because for something like this, like electric shock, it would kill you. Um, but it depends on observing what happens to other people. So a lot of learning uh, is observational learning, and there are aspects of this in other animals as well. And then I can do something even more removed than that. You don't even need to watch the person. I can just tell you, you know, at the start of the experiment, I can tell you when the blue square comes on, you're going to get a shock, and when the yellow square comes on, you won't. And if I do that to just mere instruction, again, I see differences in skin conductance response. So at least in humans, you can induce Pavlovian fear conditioning through direct experience, through observation, and through instruction. All of these depend, well, these two depend on the amygdala. This last one may be more, more um, complicated. But anyway, this is, this is one big uh, important point, that most of what you learn is from observing what happens to other people rather than having to have direct experience yourself. Um, there are also, as you might imagine, important constraints on what it is, what kinds of associations it is that you can learn in the first place. Um, so there's certain stimuli that you can learn about and that you can learn associations for and that animals can learn associations for much more easily uh, than others. So it's not all the same. It's not equally easy to associate electric shock with any kind of stimulus. Uh, and depending on what the, uh, what the unconditioned stimulus is, these can be quite, uh, quite narrow. Um, okay, now let me skip this part here and go on. Okay, so that's uh, one form of non-declarative memory, Pavlovian conditioning, which can be both appetitive, like what Pavlov originally did, if you have tasty dog food, or it can be aversive, as in Pavlovian fear conditioning. Either way, you can have a unconditioned stimulus that is either strongly positive or negatively valenced, and you can learn about that, but you're not doing anything. So you're not doing anything, the animal's not doing anything, you're passive, and you're simply, your brain is just linking uh, statistical associations between stimuli and effects that it sees out there in the, in the world. Uh, by contrast, instrumental uh, uh, learning requires that you actually do stuff, so your behavior determines the occurrence of an unconditioned stimulus. This uh, goes back to classic work by Thorndike, who had these puzzle boxes for cats. And so he made these boxes that if the cat pushed just the right kind of lever in here, it would open this door and it could get out to what's pretty possible for you to recognize here, a delicious uh, fish. And so the cat wants to do this. It wants to learn how to behave so that it gets this reward. So there's an unconditioned stimulus out here, the fish, that's highly rewarding. And the, but there's not just Pavlovian learning. The, the cat has to do something in order for that unconditioned appetitive stimulus to be obtained. You could imagine the converse in the appetitive domain. If you had an electric shock that was coming, you could have it set up so that you have to push something to be able to escape from the electric shock. In either case, you have to do something. And so animals will learn that. That's what's shown here. The time required to escape the box decreases over time because the cat learns just by random chance initially and it gets better and better at learning what to do in here in order to get the food reward. Um, okay, let me just go on to this one here. So there, um, there were a variety of different kinds of instrumental learning uh, that people have studied. Some are like what you would see in the case of the cat, where you just randomly you know, keep learning and you get better over time gradually and so you essentially build up a habit to obtain a reward or escape a shock, whatever the learning paradigm is. 
And this is known to depend on parts of the, of the basal ganglia, nuclei within the brain that are involved for motor learning and, and this kind of um, um, habit learning. There's a more complicated one uh, for which you require the prefrontal cortex that's called goal-directed instrumental learning. And there you have more of a model of, of the world and can, it's more flexible and you can figure out how to get the food not only by sort of trial and error learning, but in a more goal-directed way. This one is more flexible. Typically, or in many cases, um, you do this one first. So learning, instrumental learning, can often be very effortful. You have to know which, you have to figure out what sequence of actions to do in order to get some effect. After you do it a whole bunch of times, it becomes habitized. So it's a little bit like in the case of declarative memory, where we saw that initially it depended on working memory and it depended on uh, on loops between working memory and the hippocampus, but that over time it would get offloaded and uh, consolidated into long-term memory. Same thing here. So you can have some instrumental learning that requires you to do a bunch of uh, actions that might be quite complicated to achieve a goal. If you do it a whole bunch of times, it can uh, develop into a habit, and then uh, you don't need to do that anymore, but it becomes less flexible as a consequence. So for, for instance, if I you know, I had to learn how to drive to, uh, from my home to get here, right? And I've done that a whole bunch of times. Initially, it was quite effortful. I had to pay attention. I had a little map in my head of which streets to turn on and so on. So it was goal-directed instrumental learning. After doing that, you know, a year, I just drove on, drive on autopilot. But now, if I want to, you know, instead go to the gym or I want to go somewhere else, I start driving and suddenly I'm at lab, you know, because I, this habit kicked in and I just sort of drive, drive on autopilot. So habit, um, habits are less uh, flexible once they're set up. And I think this just says everything that I said here. Okay, so um, Pavlovian fear conditioning, again, depends on the amygdala. Contextual fear condition, remember, depends on amygdala plus hippocampus. Um, this one I didn't mention, so you don't need to know about it. Declarative memory depends on the hippocampus, and relational and spatial memory, remember, depends on the hippocampus. Um, the storage and recall of declarative memory depends on many other brain regions and interactions between hippocampus and cortex. So the main role of the hippocampus is in consolidation of declarative memory. And you remember that from the lesions in this patient's HM, HM's brain. He didn't lose all of his declarative memory. He still had declared, so this was the patient that had bilateral hippocampal lesions. He still had memory for very remote events in his past, but he had this graded, graded retrograde amnesia, so that as long as there was consolidation still going on, he, re, he needed the hippocampus. And then we have these ones just down here, that if you have habit-based forms of instrumental learning that requires the basal ganglia, whereas if it's goal-directed, it requires the frontal cortex. So each of these can be a course, and actually there is a course that talks about some of these, CS102, CNS102A, that isn't offered this year, but will be offered next year. Um, but the, the point is that just like when we had that initial, the initial taxonomy of memory, you can uh, dissociate different types of memory so what you need to know about is Pavlovian fear conditioning, declarative memory, and instrumental learning. And these depend on specific brain structures. The full brain circuits are very complicated, but these are the sort of essential brain structures. If you have damage to the frontal cortex, you have problems with goal-directed learning. If you have damage to the hippocampus, you can't consolidate declarative memory. If you have lesions of the amygdala, you can't learn Pavlovian fear conditioning. And so you could imagine uh, a final exam question that would ask you if you had some lesions in various places in the brain, what could a person, a patient, no longer do? And you should be able to predict that uh, from what you've learned here. Any questions about these type, the distinctions between these different types of memory and their links to uh, some of these brain structures here? Um, it's worth pointing out that some learning uh, can happen very, very fast. So some learning takes a long time, many, many trials, but there are specialized mechanisms set up. Uh, and, and again, this shows you that you can learn about some, you learn about some things in a certain way. It's not that you can learn to associate anything with anything. Uh, some good examples are, for instance, taste aversion conditioning. So if you uh, get very nauseated after eating something, 
you can develop an aversion to that particular taste, and that just requires one trial. Um, there's also one that I'll show you a little video of here because it's kind of interesting that's been mapped out in quite some detail, depends on the amygdala, in rodents, in hamsters, other rodents have it too, um, and it's thought to be an animal model of depression of sorts in humans. And this is a, a, a one trial form of social learning that these animals have, conditioned social defeat. So what happens, um, I didn't make these little animations here, but from somebody else who studies this, uh, what happens is that you take a male hamster and you plop him in to the cage of the home cage of another hamster. And I'll show you a video of this in a second. These two animals will fight in a very stereotyped way. It doesn't take very long. And one of them will establish itself as dominant and the other as subordinate. So one's stronger and one's weaker. And once that is set up, this, uh, the hamster that lost, basically, will never fight another male. And as soon as you present it with another male, it won't defend its home cage anymore, and it'll always try and escape. And it seems like a, a very long-term, maybe close to permanent, uh, switch in its behavior. So it's basically learned that it can't, that it's too weak, uh, as it were, anthropomorphizing somewhat. Uh, and it instead just shows a very large stress response to any other male hamster instead of trying to defend itself. Um, Sorry, let me just show you what that looks like. So here, what we're going to do, we've just plopped in one hamster into another hamster's home cage, both males. And as I said, they will always, they will immediately fight. And very quickly, they will establish, they will figure out, uh, it's hard, to, hard for us to tell, but they can figure out which one is stronger and weaker. And you can tell that when that happens, because one of them, the weaker one, will suddenly stop fighting and instead try to escape. So it's like, like a switch. And when that switch happens, after that switch, that hamster will never fight another hamster. So here they are initially, and they're fighting, kind of biting around, wrestling. And you'll see when this happens. Uh, just, it'll just take a few more seconds. So initially, this hamster fights and defends its home turf. And there, suddenly, it figured out it was too weak. And now it runs away, and it won't ever fight another hamster. And you can test this now. So a week or months later, you can take that same hamster that, uh, was, that experienced conditioned defeat, and you can drop in another hamster to its cage. So that's what's done here, but he doesn't fight at all. So this hamster that was just dropped in is wondering why there's nobody here to fight with. And the one uh, here that, was, that experienced defeat before instead just had the super high stress response and wants to escape. And you can measure all these changes in cortisol, stress hormones in this animal, and it seems like a permanent switch in uh, behavior. So it's, it's just one particular model system, but it's very striking. It shows you essentially what seems like permanent changes in the behavior of an animal from one single uh, learning episode in a very, very specific social um, context. And again, it depends, it depends on the amygdala. If you infuse drugs into the amygdala that block and the receptors, this doesn't happen. Uh, so you can, uh, you can do a lot of uh, manipulations. Okay, last few slides to end on to encourage you to get more sleep. Uh, I think I alluded to this very briefly uh, uh, a few lectures ago. It, sleep is extremely important. It's essential in all, uh, whenever anybody has tried to deprive an animal of sleep, those animals have died. So lack of sleep will kill you. It does happen in humans with a rare um, disease, fatal familial insomnia, but not volitionally. But anyway, this is how much um, the National Sleep Foundation says you need to sleep, and you probably get a lot less. And you might think, well, you know, can I, what's sleep good for? Can I get by with less? Sleep, sleep uh, seems to subserve many complex homeostatic functions, but one thing that it seems to do is to uh, renormalize the strength of your synapses. So during the day, there's lots of LTP going on, and lots of synapses are potentiated, and learning is going on. You need to somehow uh, renormalize that and bring that down and um, to some extent stabilize certain memories while forgetting others. So there's complex mechanisms that have to do with renormalizing the strength of synapses that have been potentiated through experience during the day and stabilizing memories that's, that require sleep. So when people have studied this, I'm just, uh, yeah, maybe this, this is fairly clear. Uh, in humans, it's, uh, it depends on certain tasks, but you can have people do various tasks. So here's one particular motor sequence learning task in humans. If you have the same time elapse between learning the task 
and then testing, and you're awake, this is the improvement that you would see here between these two green bars, for instance. Whereas if you have the same time elapse, but after training on this task, you take a nap, and then you test the person. So the time interval is identical, except in one case you slept, in the other, other not. That sleep leads to a big improvement in performance. And this is a very reliable effect that people have found on certain tasks, that there seems to be a, uh, a requirement for sleep such that if you have consolidation of memory uh, during sleep, it greatly improves your performance. On, this is a non-declarative memory task, just a motor sequence learning task. People have done it with other more complicated things. Let me just show you the last one. Uh, this is a task, uh, the Tower of Hanoi here, where you have to figure out how to move all of these disks onto another peg here. Maybe Many of you have maybe done this. And you can never have a smaller disk underneath a larger one. So you have to figure out how to do that. So it takes a while when you actually do this. Um, and it turns out the same thing happens. So when you do this during the day, and you wait for some time to elapse, and you ask how good are you, you are not really much better after uh, several hours. But if you sleep on it, you get better. So this is a much more complicated uh, task that presumably involves elements both of declarative and non-declarative learning. Uh, that essentially is something like insight. So insight or the ability to construct more abstract memory representations that can allow you to solve complex problems in humans does seem to require sleep as well. Uh, so I wanted to end on that note to encourage you all to get sleep because it will help you consolidate uh, what you learned in this course. Okay.